Recording will start soon. I think it's starting now. Okay, I think the recording's going. So any questions um, right off the bat? Uh, act, uh, you know what, actually, I'll get to the announcements first and then we can go over any questions about that because I'm sure you guys are like wondering about exam grading or stuff like that. But um, yeah, so we'll do that first. Um, yeah, general announcements. The midterm results should be out very soon, hopefully today or tomorrow. Um, project three is due June 9th, so six days from now. Um, definitely make sure that you've started it, if not already. Um, and yeah, uh, I think like general tips for project three would be to definitely like have a solid plan on paper before actually typing up your code um, because I feel like you can it can get pretty messy because there's a lot of different commands so if you have like a very organized plan on paper it'll make programming a lot less uh, overwhelming um, the lab 7 quiz and lab 7 auto grader are due June 12th um, yeah there is an auto grader assignment for this lab um, definitely don't like ignore it um, as soon as you're done if you can get project 3 done before the deadline definitely like start working on lab 7 whenever you can, as soon as you can, because typically, I, I would say lab seven is probably the most difficult lab. Um, however, um, yeah, just don't, yeah, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it, that's for sure. So get to that whenever you can. Um, lab six survey, I think it's still open. So I know like you guys have to input your grades. So whenever, whenever we should be releasing them today or tomorrow. Um, so once that is out, then yeah, lab six will, you can. You should be able to finish that survey up. Um, yeah, the auto grader is not up for lab seven yet, but it should be up today or tomorrow. Um, and then, yeah, I also, like in the past, we didn't really have, I don't think we had a make file. I just posted that um, in the folder. It should be released at some point today um, on Canvas. And that'll have just like some simple commands to make some stuff easier. Um, as well as I have a small test file that's not complete whatsoever. It's just like uh, one simple test and should just make it easier for you guys to test your header. Um, but yeah, so more, yeah, you guys, and then once the Canvas file is um, unveiled, then you should be able to see all the details for the Lab 7 assignment. But any questions, um, you could unmute yourselves to ask as well um, about uh, Lab 7 or any of these announcements. I'm looking in the chat. Lab 7 AG says it's due this Friday. I'm guessing that's a mistake then. Is that on Canvas? It says eight, the auto graders do this Friday. That's, that would be wrong if that's the case. I think it should be due June 12th. Uh, let me double check though. Um, yeah, I don't think it's... Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think that's enough time to be due this Friday. Let's see. Yeah, on Canvas, it does say, oh, that's the, okay. So written, oh, yeah, auto grader due June 5th, definitely not. Like, this should be due June 12th. I'll talk to Dr. P, and I'll make note of that right now. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm sure that's not the case, because it's like, it's definitely not a lab that should be due that quickly. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing it should be due when the quiz is due. So, and that should be the case for everything else going forward. Um, I'm not sure why this one was messed up, but I'll make note of that. So, canvas wrong. Um, look in chat and see if there's any other questions. Um, lab seven folder will be up after I finish lab, this live lab, then I'll like make sure that it's on, because it's like, it's up there, it's just not visible, so. I'll make it visible after this if it's not automatically doing that, which it might be. Um, but if it's not, I'll make it visible uh, once this is done. Um, and then any other questions before we get started on the bulk of the lab? All right, I will. Get started then. Um, also, I'm like on a separate screen from the Google Meet, and I, and for some reason, the chat like 
dings are not going off, like this, not the noise. So I'll like check back periodically to see if you guys are putting questions in chat. Um, but also feel free to unmute if you have any questions. All right then. So let's get into the stuff. So yeah, this is just the agenda for the day. Um, not much to really say on this, but yeah, we're gonna go through all of this stuff and that's the bulk of it. Um, so yeah, the previous handwritten problem, these slides will be posted, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, I also don't really know. I don't know if this is also up to date or not, because these are last semester slides. So we'll just skip over this. Um, and if you want to see that stuff, it'll be posted on Canvas. Um, but yeah, I also don't, I, I know like we're doing, we did the writtens differently due to the grade scope stuff and doing stuff online. So I don't know if that's even relevant. Uh, regardless, let's talk about hash functions. So any, well, actually any general questions about hash functions before we get into it or I'll just start explaining. Okay, let's do it. So just to recall, um, we it just hash tables in general. Uh, we use hash, hash functions in order to map uh, specific keys to an, an integer value or a number. Um, and because of that, as long as our hash function is um, big theta of one, then that allows for our average case for insert, lookup, and delete to also be big theta of one because insert, lookup, and delete will always be making calls to the hash function. So our hash function needs to be big theta of one. Um, additionally, it's important that the result of the hash function, you modulo it by the size of the underlying container um, in order to map it to a particular index within your underlying container. Um, because the result of the hash function is just gonna be an integer value and it might not be a valid index in particular. So that's covered here. Um, you'll have like your underlying container, like the size of it is what number buckets represents. So whatever the result of your hash function is, you'll definitely wanna modulo it to make sure it goes to a valid index because your hash function doesn't need to be guaranteed to fit the constraints of any particular container size. So don't forget to do this, um, especially in the lab seven assignment for the auto grader, because that'll be important. Um, and also just in practice problems as well. And so yeah, just in general, it's good to note that the hash function result, sometimes like the, it might be a valid index. However, if it's beyond the size of the container, then you'll need to modulo it. Um, but it, you should just be doing this every time, no matter what, to make it simple. Um, a bit of rustling of the mic. I was just checking the chat. Is the mic okay now? Okay, cool. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Anyway, so two invariants of the hash function, you wanna make sure it's consistent and efficient. So you want it to be consistent in that no matter, whenever you're putting in a key, it's always gonna output the same thing. Because if it was just random, then that's not gonna be a very good hash function because then you don't have, your amount of, co your collisions could be, are pretty much just randomized and there's not a really easy, it's not as easy to handle that. Um, and you'll also be searching in different places each time. So yeah, if it was random, it would just be a mess. So you wanna make sure it's consistent um, and then efficient, like I had mentioned before, as long as your hash function is big theta of one, this is what allows all of the operations to be big theta of one. Um, and that's the whole purpose of using a hash, a hash table to begin with. So it's very important that your hash function is efficient in that regard. Um, so now let's take a look at um, some examples of hash functions. Um, and let's talk about why these could be bad. And so I, I, obviously it says kind of like right here, like that uh, these are all gonna create a lot of collisions. But let's talk about why. So for the first hash function, hash one, why does that create a lot of collisions? If anyone wants to put it in chat, I'm looking at chat right now, if anyone wants to put it in chat or unmute their mic. Yeah. Yeah, Eleanor said it good. So yeah, it gives, if, since it's just returning one every time, then you're gonna have a collision every time and you'll need to do some sort of probing or separate chaining to handle that every single time you 
go to the hash function. So that's good. Then hash two, let's talk about why, let's talk about what, what's up with this. So yeah, let's talk about this hash collision, I guess. So what is, this one is better, but it's still, I guess to make this faster, I'll just go through it. So this one's, it's better in that it's not returning the same thing every time. However, a lot of words start with the same letter. So you're still gonna have a ton of collisions. So that might not be the best. Yeah, exactly. Hurry and set it good. Um, yeah, so everything starting with the same letter will map to the same index. Um, and then the third hash function, what might be up with this one? Yeah, yeah, Kevin said it good. So yeah, if you have like different permutations, then it's gonna be mapping to the same. Um, yeah, and so yeah, these are just examples of hash functions that cause uh, many different collisions. And you wanna try and avoid things like this um, in general. So let's go through a quick exercise using this hash two hash function. Um, and so yeah, just on your own, let's figure out like, oops, I didn't realize cl clicking would do that, but regardless, um, yeah, essentially like this is, this is return, like the actual return from the hash function. So I showed it on the screen, so it's not really worth spending time on. However, obviously, yes, yeah, because we do Z minus A, then that'll, that'll compile, that'll be fine with characters. Um, you'll get 25 and dog you'll get three because of D and F you'll get five. Now, notice that the N, like the size of our, when we say N equals 10 up here, that's implying that um, the size of the underlying container is 10. So a better question would be, what is the actual index at which each of these will be inserted? If you guys wanna put that in chat or say it. Um, so you'd have to take the result of the hash function, which we previously determined, and then do something based on the size of the container. Yep, zebra would be five. Yep, dog would be three. And Yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, both of those are pretty much correct. Yeah, like um, fest could be six or yeah, it could just depend on the collision resolution as well. If we're assuming linear probing, then yeah, it would be six. Um, like in this case, in, based on this question, I think it was looking for just what's, the, what's like the basic bucket it would be mapped to, but that's good. You guys are ahead of the game. It's a good job. Like, yeah, because obviously like there is a collision, so it would have to be resolved in some way. Um, and yeah, you guys identified that um, because Zebra and Fast would both map to the same bucket in this case. So speaking of that, obviously we need to do some collision resolution whenever we have collisions, as we just saw. Um, there's two basic types of collision resolution, uh, separate chaining and open addressing. Separate chaining involves doing things with a linked list. While open addressing um, in this class will encompass linear probing quadratic probing and double hashing. Uh, before we get to this, were there any questions about hash functions and what they do, what they're supposed to do, um, and like how we got these results here? Essentially, we took the result of the hash function and modulated it by the size of the container, which in this case was 10. Um, so any questions on that? Why zebra and fest are both five? Yeah, sure. So the previous, so we, in this part, we said, okay, the hash function will take in the string zebra and fest and it'll, and the, val the value it will return will be the first character minus the character A. So that's what gave us 25, three and five. Oh, and then you said, okay. Okay, I'll get to the next question in a second. Um, but yeah, so zebra would be 25 because Z minus, those are 25 characters apart. Um, if A is zero, like Z is the 25th character. Um, and F is the fifth character in that sense from in the alphabetical order. So that's why you have 25 and five. Then after this, because those are that's just gonna be the value returned by the hash function. 
However, that we our container that we're going into has a size of 10. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see when I'm like highlighting things on the screen or not. One second. Oh yeah, you can, okay. Um, but yeah, so our container is of size 10. So Zebra being 25, there's no index 25 in our container underlying. Um, so we need to modulo it by the size of the container, which gives us the remainder. Um, and that'll give us a valid index. So when we do 25 modulo 10, then we get the value five. And we do the same for dog and fest with three and five. However, since three, when you have a, when a number is moduloed by a larger number, then that number persists. So like three modulo 10 is gonna be three and five modulo 10 is gonna be five. So zebra was larger than 10. So it'll reduce to the remainder, which is five. And that collides with fest in this case. Does that make sense, Neil? Okay, cool. And then, all right, how do I say, is it Aryan or Aryan? Um, but anyway, you said hash function dependent on the data type. Um, can we hash a custom struct? So yeah, so the hash function, yeah, you'd wanna use a different hash function. Typically, I think that the, the SDL has a hash function called hash, I think, and it takes in a custom struct. It'll take in like any type and hash it as long as it has an overload for operator equals and operator equal equal. So like equivalent operator like equivalence as well as not equal to. So as long as those things are made for your custom struct, then I think your hash function your hash function using the standard hash should be able to work. Um, however, typically, like if you are using something that isn't, if you're using an unordered map or an unordered set and you wanted to say map pairs to integers and pairs are your key, pairs by default don't have a, um, a hash function for the, like for unordered map or unordered set. So if you're using pair as your key, you'll need to create a hash function to pass into your unordered map or unordered set. You probably won't have to do that um, in project three. That's the only place you would have to do it, if at all. But that won't be necessary for project three to have a custom hash function unless you wanted to do an implementation that was much different than what like we're expecting. Um, however, yeah, if you did have a custom like data type um, as a key, that would need it, it would then it would need to have um, operator equals equals overloaded and then operator not equal to overloaded, and then you'd pass like the STL hash function. Um, however, otherwise, like if you're just like passing in the, the hash function as like a, if you're just passing in like a random data type when you're not using like the standard hash function from the standard library, then you'd have to use a custom hash function. Um, and yeah. But you typically shouldn't have to run into that. However, it's good to know. So collision resolution. I had previously mentioned separate chaining, open addressing. Um, pretty much the difference is separate chaining uses a linked list, while open addressing uses different probing methods to find a new location in the in the underlying container to insert the object. So separate chaining, like I said before, it's using a linked list. So anytime that you have a collision your new element is going to just be tacked on to the linked list at that bucket. So each bucket, like in this container, pretty much it represents a linked list. Um, and as you can see at the 152nd bucket, um, John, where John Smith and the, the number there, it, when, it, when Sandra D collides with it, then it is just tacked on to the linked list and it will, you'll add on more elements as needed. Um, any questions on the gist of separate chaining before we discuss the time complexities real quick? Okay, I think that's all good. Um, so can anyone give me the best average case and worst case time complexities of using separate chaining for lookup or insert and essentially delete as well?
Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I see what you mean by O of alpha, Kevin. Yeah, that's something we'll get to when we talk about load factor. Um, however, assuming we haven't been talking about load factor um, and load factor, yeah, uh, then, yeah, because in the sides we have it in order of like, we'll talk about load factor at the end. Um, that's okay though. So, but yeah, so essentially, yeah, we have O of one or big theta of one, big theta of one and big theta of N. Um, yeah, typically, yeah, the average case we'll see later that it could be different depending on the amount of keys and the size of the linked list. Um, in this case, or for open addressing, the amount of keys and the number of buckets. Um, and we'll get to that later. And then, yeah, worst case would be O of N because imagine we're searching for an item uh, at the very end of a linked list. And if we're searching for it at the very end of a linked list, then we need to traverse the size of that linked list, which would, which in this case is N. Yeah, yeah, you got it, Evan. That's good. Yeah, assuming there's the keys are randomly distributed, then yeah, average case would be O of one or big theta of one. So any other questions about separate chaining before we go move on to open addressing? Okay, all good. So open addressing, we'll start with linear probing. Um, linear probing, what we'll do is we will call our hash function and I will always start at zero. So when, when we take some certain key, we'll calculate, we'll have the hash function plus zero. So that'll just be the result of our hash value or our hash value, which is the result of our hash function. And from that, we'll modulo by the size of the container. And with this, we'll get an index for our container. And this, if this index initially uh, leads to a, a collision, then we'll want to do this step again. However, we'll increment i. So then we'll do the, our hash value result, our hash function result, which is our hash value. And then we'll say plus one, and then we'll modulo by the size of the container. So that'll search like, essentially it's searching the next container over, the next bucket over. Um, and it'll, you'll go bucket by bucket until you find an empty spot or which we'll discuss later when there's deleting involved, then you'll find the first deleted element potentially. Um, however, that's not what we're, we'll assume that there's no deleting as of right now. So let's go through an example. Um, take a couple minutes. Um, you could write it out on paper if you want. I'll give you guys like um, four minutes. I, I, it might, even if you don't finish, that's okay. I just want to make sure we get through all the examples in the slides. Um, but go through and try and insert the, and you assume, yeah, number of buckets is six, um, and insert these four keys uh, based on this hash function that we had earlier. Um, and use linear probing to resolve collisions. So yeah, I'll give you guys four minutes to do that. Um, and then we'll come back and discuss. Also, if you have any questions about linear probing, go ahead and put that in chat and I'll address them. Um, I would say just like leave it for yourself on paper for now. It's until everyone or until I call for time. And then if you want to put it and then yeah, I'll ask for them in chat once time is up. Yeah, so yeah, I said four minutes. So we'll call that 327 or 327 and 30 seconds, let's say. And we'll get back to it.
Okay, let's uh, so yeah, if anyone has answers they want to put in chat, go ahead and put those in. Um, and then we'll discuss. Yep, yep, yep. Those look good. Okay, let's go through it. Um, and then, yeah, after we go through it, if you have any questions on any of the particular steps, I'll address those as well. So initially, we if we hash all of these based on our hash function result, we get uh, this combination. And obviously, we have what would be three collisions if we didn't have any resolution, or two collisions, I guess, um, with cop and cat and then cartographer and cat because cat would be the first one to be there. So initially cat is fine because there's nothing in the container. So we can just insert that at index two. Um, also note that in this case, the hash values maintained at, even after moduloing by six because all of these are smaller than six. So um, however, it's still a step that you should do when, in your, when you're working on lab seven. Um, so yeah, so cat, goes to index two without any issues. Then COP um, will have a collision at index two. So just by linear probing, we'll look at the next bucket and we'll see that it's avail it's empty. Um, so that means we can insert it there and we'll insert it at three. Now with ear, ear hashes to index four and index four doesn't have any issues. So ear can go right there. And then finally, cartographer. Cartographer, again, collides with cat at index two. So then we linear probe to three, and we see three is occupied, so we can't insert there. Then we linear probe to four, and we see four is occupied, so we can't insert there. And then finally, we linear probe to five, which is empty initially. So cartographer can go there, which should be all good. And that's what we end up with. Um, so anyone have any questions about that before we move on to, oh, maybe, oh, okay, interesting. Um, so yeah, I guess, yeah, you guys can also do this, insert, the, insert, try inserting duck, but any questions about those four that were inserted and also insert duck as well. Okay, so I'm assuming no questions. So if you guys want to insert duck and any, someone just put in the chat what index you think that would end up at. Nice, yeah, yeah, zero is correct. So the reason for this is because when we're doing our linear probing, we'll eventually get to, once we reach six, um, there is no sixth index, of course, which is why when we modulo by six, we get back, we wrap around to zero. So we'll be inserting at zero because that's the first one that's empty. And so, yeah, this kind of just shows that the importance of module of just always using the modulo to make sure that you're within the bounds of the container. Um, Cause otherwise you probably have a seg fault or something. Um, but yeah. So once you get to the end, you then wrap around thanks to the modulo um, operation. So yeah, any questions about that before we move on to quadratic probing? Okay, cool. Let's move on to quadratic probing. So quadratic probing is a very similar process to linear probing. You're still gonna be incrementing I every time that you need to probe a new location. However, this time it's gonna be squared. So just, you'll always be incrementing i by one. However, just make sure that after i is incremented, the result is squared. Um, and then that will be the next con like location that we're checking. So you calculate the hash value using the hash function. Um, and you add, you st i starts at zero um, for each iteration too. So like whenever you have a new element that you're inserting, your i will always start at zero. And then for each time you need to probe, you'll increment i. Um, however, make sure that thing that gets squared, and then we'll modulo it by the container size to look for our new location. 
So with quadratic probing, um, let's say, yeah, in this case, we have n equals 10. So the size of our container, we have 10 indices that you see down here. Um, I'm trying to think if, we, if I should, I think it's a good, yeah, because typically there would be a worksheet if we had in person. So I think it's actually good for you guys to go through each of these exercises before we discuss them. So let's do that again. Let's do what we did with linear probing, except this time with quadratic probing. And just make sure you recall this general way to go about calculating, make sure you're doing the squaring. Um, and yeah, so go ahead and take another four minutes or so and insert these four values and handle the collisions using quadratic probing. And yeah, so yeah, we'll come back at, I'll give you guys three minutes and we'll come back at uh, 336 or 337, sorry. Could you go back to the formula for a sec? Yeah. So this is the basic formula for quadratic chroming. And then I will go back to the, the, the keys are the same from the last example, but just in case. Yeah, I is gonna be essentially, yeah, the number of, well, not the number of times you have a collision, but the number of times you need to probe. So once you have a collision, then you start probing and you'll increment I for each index you need to keep probing. And the number of indices that you probe is gonna be essentially the number of buckets that are occupied um, until you find an empty bucket. Yeah, no problem. All right, so if anyone wants to, even if, if you're not done, okay, cool. Yep, two, three, four, six, looking good. Looking good, guys. Okay, yep, nice job, everybody. Okay, so let's discuss. Um, yeah, two, three, four, yeah, two, three, four, six is the result. So let's go through each one. So cat, no problem with cat because it's the first one being inserted, so there's not gonna be a collision. Um, so that will go to index two, no problem. Now cop, um, we'll start off, we'll try to insert a two. We see that's, we can't insert there. So we'll increment that I value if we had from our hash function um, in that quadratic probing hash function. So it's just gonna be one in this case. So one squared will still be one. So then we'll check index three and th that's empty. So we can insert cop there. 
Uh, ear doesn't have a collision, so we can just insert that in index four. And then finally, cartographer, um, we'll try it two. Then we'll increment I to get one and try it three. Then increment I again, and then it's two, but then since it's squared, we get, we're checking index six, which is empty. So we can insert totally fine at index six. And that's what we get with our results. Um, any questions about what we got here? The probing graphic is really good. Yeah, it is really good. I you know I didn't make it, but thank you. Even though I did not make this. Yeah, this has been around for I think a couple of semesters, but yeah, it's definitely it's it's really good. I like the way it's done. Um, but yeah, so if there are no questions about what was inserted here, if you have any, just put it in chat. Um, try and insert duck now. And I don't, I think that, yeah, so let's see where duck would end up in this case. Yep, seven, yep. Yep, seven, good job, good job. So yeah, since three, we'll start at three. Um, three is taken, so then we'll at, we'll have i will be equal to one. So we'll check four, and yeah, always remember we're moduloing. Um, however, it's not yeah. We'll, oh yeah, just always remember to be doing that. So then we'll increment i again, and we'll check seven, and seven is empty, so we can insert there. So yeah, duck would go in index seven. If I yeah, I can't really highlight it. Um, yeah, so yeah, duck would go here. Okay, now let's move on to double hashing, which is a little more complex, um, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, essentially what we're gonna be doing with double hashing, actually, before we do this, any other questions, lasting questions on, yeah, okay, so basically we keep applying the formula until we find an empty spot. Yes, essentially, yes. Um, you wanna keep doing it until you find an empty spot. Um, we're gonna be talking about erasing elements um, in a little bit. And once we're erasing elements, then the process changes a little bit. And we'll go through an example with linear probing on how that changes. Um, however, essentially it changes based on like, if you find a deleted element, you'll wanna kind of save that location to insert at. Um, however, if it's then, in, but you wanna keep searching until you find an empty one. But we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, for what we're at right now, we want to keep probing until we find an empty spot. And then we'll insert there. So yeah, moving on to double hashing. Double hashing, uh, we're going to be using two hash functions whenever we have a collision. Um, if, we're, if there's no collisions, then the second hash function will um, not be important. It'll still be called probably based on the implementation, but it won't be as important. Oh, what, what just happened? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we have, what we have is we have our original hash function, um, which will give us our hash value. And then we still have an I that we'd be incrementing for each time we probe um, and always starting at zero. And then we have our second hash function, which, um, I'll talk about when we get there, but that will return a, it'll be different from our original hash function. And that'll just return a new value that will be multiplying by I um, for each probe. And so whatever F of K returns for any given key, that'll always be the same value. It's just, again, we'll be changing I each time we probe. And that's what will cause this to be like a, this whole expression to be different in each probe. And then again, always modulo by the container size. So yeah, we'll call, I think, yeah, in this case, hash, yeah, hash is gonna be our first hash. And then yeah, hash two is gonna be our second hash. Um, and yeah, as you can see, the only difference is that um, hash is taking from the front and subtracting from character A and hash two is taking from the back and subtracting character A. So based on this, um, and I'll try, I'm trying, I wish I, yeah. The, I'll, I'll type this in chat real quick, just so you guys can see it when you're work, because I want you guys to go through this example again, um, except with double hashing. So I'll put this 
in chat real quick, but yeah, go through this example um, with the new double hashing method. So yeah, I'll throw the type this in chat real quick. Um, that's good. And then modulo n. So I put the expression in chat and that's the form you should be using to handle collisions. So go through and resolve collisions um, using this method. And also let it be noted that um, like when you're resolving collisions, it's always based on the first hash function. It's not based on the second one. So like you could have a, like they could map to the same location in the second, like the same value in the second hash function. However, since it's being multiplied by I, you're not, it's not, you're not going to be need to be worrying about collisions with this hash function in particular. But yeah, I think going through an example will make that clear. So I'll give you guys five minutes for this one. So we'll come back and discuss at uh, 349.
All right, so let's discuss. If anyone has wants to give their answer, go ahead. Okay. 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 All right, then. Cool. Let's go through and check these out, then. Those are all looking pretty good to me, so let's go through each, each one. So cat, again, since it's the first one being inserted, there's no collision um, that could possibly happen. So, and it'll just go to index two. Now with cop, as you guys, many of you pointed out, um, there is a collision at index two. So we'll, we'll multiply i, which in this case would be one times the result of our second hash function to get us 15. Oh, where did that? Um, get us the result of our second hash function, which will get us 15. So that'll give us uh, the value 17. However, we do that modulo the size of the container, which is 10. And that gives us index seven, which is empty. So we'll insert cop there. Then we move on to ear and ear, there's no collision happening. Um, so ear can be index or inserted at index four. And then finally cartographer, yeah, finally cartographer, which there's a collision at index two. However, we only really need to do one probe this time versus with linear probing, I think we had to do five or four and, or maybe three. Um, and then with quadratic probing, we had to do two. Um, and so for this time, we only need to do one. Um, and that gave us, um, because, because of the second hash function being different than cops, um, then we were able to just insert at index nine because nine modulo or 19 modulo 10 was index nine. Um, so any questions about the double hashing that we just did? Why isn't it two plus two times 17? Um, so for cartographer, as I, as I was saying, we only needed to do one collision, one um, probe um, because the second hash function is different from cops hash function. So because of that, like what we're doing is we're still base. if I have the, um, I put the formula in chat um, the, but I'll go back to the slide. So because of this formula, we still will start at I equals zero for, so when we do cartographer, so cart cartographer H of K was two, um, F of K was 17. So we start at zero, uh, two was a collision because uh, cat was there. Um, however, once we got to cartographer, um, we know that the second collision or the sec, sorry, the second hash function result, it was 17. So we increment I by one because we just, we just got to position two and we'll check and then we'll check the next possible um, location, which would, in this case was index nine. So we didn't need to do two times 17. We only need to do one times 17 um, because the next index was nine, which was empty. So we only need to do one pro. Does that make sense? I think he's saying two because the second time we we're clouding with cat. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. So I think I had mentioned this before that every time that we have a collision, that's not what I is based on. I is based on the number of probes for any given collision. So once you have a new collision, you should always start at I equals zero. So that's what we were doing with cartographer. With cartographer, we collided with two and we're gonna start with I equals zero. Same thing with cop. With cop, we started at I equals zero. And then we incremented I to one to check for the next location. And then we, for then once we got to cartographer, we did the same thing. We started at I equals zero then we incremented I by one because we had a collision and then we got our empty um, bucket. Does that make more sense? The key is to that I should be reset every time we're inserting a new key. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's a good question to, yeah, because that can be confusing sometimes. Um, so yeah, any other questions about double hashing? There's not a duck example in the slides for double hashing, but could anyone tell me where duck would be inserted? Just like quickly, if you want. Is 
Three. Yeah, three. Yeah, because the first, because in this case, there's in the previous two examples with quadratic and linear, there was a an element at index three, so there'd be a collision with duck. But in this case, there's no collision with duck, so it would just go at index three, which was the result of the first hash function. Um, yeah. Any questions? Any other questions about double hashing before we move on to handling deleted elements? Okay, cool. Oh, so is double hashing going to be generally more spread out in terms of indices? Uh, typically, yes. I think, yeah, double hashing will probably be the most spread out, um, depending on how different it is from the, the, depending on like how different the two hash functions are. Like in this case, um, they're pretty different because like the first and second letters, at least in these examples, are, very, are like pretty far apart letters. So that's why, like this case, double hashing is what it is. Like if, if the two hash functions, or let's say all of the examples were palindromes, then that means the first and last letter are gonna be the same. Um, then these two hash functions would be the same exact result. So then in effect, I think we would have, I think we would just have linear, we would have something very close to linear probing in that sense, where it wouldn't be as spread out because the two hash functions resulted in the same value, even though they were different. Um, so like if there, if it's like a good double hashing scheme, then yes, like the indices will be more spread out and it'll be uh, typically a faster way of handling um, like collisions. Uh, I think that we'll get to it when we talk, when we have like summarize it at the end, but I know the STL uses separate chaining um, for unordered map and unordered set, I'm pretty sure. Um, and separate chaining actually surprisingly tends to be a lot more efficient. Um, I don't really know all the details of like the SDL implementations, but yeah. Also oh, makes more sense because hash function two uh, usually has large numbers. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, in this in this example, yeah, hash function two resulted in larger numbers that were very different from the original hash function. Um, and if you have that in other cases, then yeah, you'll typically have more spread out. But yeah, as I was saying, yeah, separate chaining tends to be more efficient and there will be a slide kind of talking about that, um, at least for the STL purposes. However, in this class, like it will, we'll, we're emphasizing the open addressing methods just because I, um, it's good for understanding hash tables, I, th I feel. It's like, it's really good for understanding like the hashing process. Um, and yeah, so you'll see that on the lab seven quiz as well. Yeah, no problem. Okay, let's move on to deleting elements and so when we delete elements, um, th there's things we want to do to make sure we know when we have an index that we deleted something. So this is kind of just like a basic example that encompasses that. Um, so we inserted cat at bucket two and we inserted cop at bucket three. So let's say we remove cat. So cat is no longer here. What happens when we want to, oh, what happens when we want to try and find cop again? And recall that cop had a hash function two. And when we're doing lookup, we start at the hash function result and then we need to probe again. So like linear pro, and let's say we assume linear probing. Um, but yeah, just recall that linear probing, quadratic probing and double hashing, all that, like we did examples with insert, but it also applies when we're doing lookup and also when we're erasing because erasing you need to look up. So recall that like the probing stuff also applies to lookup, which is very important for finding elements in your table. So let's think what happens here. Let's say we remove cat. So if we just remove cat and don't do anything, then index two is going to be empty. So if we do a lookup on cop, can anyone tell me like what would happen? Would we return like true or false? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you guys got it. It would return false because the bucket at index two, if we're saying like cat doesn't exist, if I could, if I could just highlight it, oh, PDF is just not my friend. Um, but yeah, so index two, if we just focus on index two where cat is, if that was empty, and then when we try and look up cop, it's going to say, oh, cop's not here because it's not at the index that it's supposed to be hashed at. And we're not even going to do any probing because there's no element there, so there's no collision. So what we need to do instead is 
store an element. So yeah, this is summarize what I said, like looks empty. So we're going to say it's not there. So we kind of need to have a placeholder. So we'll have this term deleted and that'll kind of, that'll represent like the status of the bucket. Um, and when the status is deleted, then we could say, okay, it's deleted. So there's no element here, but we still need to keep looking because there could be things after this deleted spot. Does that make sense to everyone what we're trying to do here? We're trying to make sure that the we're saving the spaces where we erased elements in order to keep looking for elements that exist that might have moved because of collision resolution. Cool. If anyone has any questions, just put it. Oh yeah. So, so when you search up cop with deleted come up. So yeah. So now if we search cop, we'll go to cop's original hash index, which is two um, because that's where it normally would go. And in this case, we would see that it's deleted. So if we see that it's deleted, then we say, okay, we need to probe. Because if we see that it's deleted, we would need to probe. And then if we probe, obviously, if, we, if we're assuming linear probing, we'll go to the next element and that'll be where cop is. So then we'll say, okay, we found cop. Um, we'll go through exa an example in a little bit, but oh yeah. So what would we use to indicate it's deleted? The actual string deleted. So in terms of implementing, um, and you're actually like, so lab, the lab seven auto grader is gonna be, it's you're literally implementing like hash table functions and operations. And so the way we have it set up there is that each bucket has, each bucket is like a struct. And within that struct, there's a status variable, which is either going to be, yeah, exactly. Yeah, in the enum class, exactly. So you'd have like occupied, deleted and empty. So if a bucket was erased, then you'd wanna replace it with, um, essentially just a bucket that has the status deleted. And that's how you'd handle that. So did I answer all of those questions? So yeah, essentially, yeah, we would use like a status variable in an enum class to represent deleted. And also when we're searching up cop, we would go to the deleted, we would say, okay, it's deleted. So that means we need to probe because it doesn't mean that cop doesn't exist. So we'll search and then we'll see cop and we'll find it. If cop actually also didn't exist, then we would keep probing until we found an empty index. And once you find an empty index, and if you haven't found cop, then you know cop doesn't exist. That's really what the point of deleted is doing. So that no matter what, once you see an empty index, then you know that your element that you're searching for does not exist. And deleted allows us to have that property. And we're gonna go through an example. So I think that'll be more clear when we go through it. But if you have any other questions, anyone, feel free to put it in chat. So you can't say that with quad double hashing, right? Um, are you saying like you can't say that you can stop with open space? Um, I think that it would still maintain, we'll go, the example we're going through is linear probing. So that conveys it easier, but I think it would also maintain with quadratic and double hashing. The reason being that any element that you're inserting will follow whatever pattern the double hashing or quadratic probing pattern would follow. So like when we inserted cop in double hashing, we ended up at index seven. So when we see deleted at index two, the first thing we check with double hashing with cop would be index seven, because we're still gonna be checking based on like the results from cop. So we're still gonna be checking the possible element like locations for where cop would be. So it would still work. Yep, no problem. Okay, cool. Let's see, so yeah, any other questions, put them in chat. I'll check back periodically. Um, let's go through an example. And yeah, this one's with linear probing just because it's um, easier to get the point across. But it, like I had previously mentioned, it also works with quadratic probing and double hashing. So yeah, take a couple minutes. Um, I'll say like five minutes again um, to do these three operations. If I could just, oh. it, uh, yeah. So yeah, these three operations, um, and you know, I don't, yeah, maybe five minutes might be too long. Let's call it four minutes. Um, so yeah, do these three operations, and we'll come back. So yeah, three oh eight or four oh eight.
Okay, guys, let's uh, resume. Anybody have, uh, want to put their results? Oh yeah, sorry, Ronald. Yeah, we're doing, we were doing a practice problem. So uh, let's, let's say, yeah, where's the location of cartographer? That would be like the result we're looking for. Okay, six, two, and we'll go through it to double check. Six, two, uh, I'm guessing Evan's pointing to two, two. Okay. Looking good, let's go through the, let's go through it. So, all right, we delete. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I understand why I could have come up with six because that would be the first empty container. So this will be good for conveying like what we're doing. So we'll erase cat. So we have a deleted element now at position two. Um, now we're deleting cartographer. So in this case, we're doing linear probing. So again, we're doing the same lookup um, sequence where we're starting at index two and we're linear probing to three, four, and then finally five where we find cartographer. Um, and then we found cartographer so we could delete it. Um, and yeah, like this, I kind of mentioned this earlier where you need to keep looking until you find either an empty spot or the key is actually found. In this case, cartographer was found, so we deleted it. Um, but otherwise, like I had said before, once we find an empty spot, then we know it's a miss and the key is not there. Um, if we hadn't, we would have wrongly assumed cartographer wasn't in the table. Oh, um, so yeah, like, yeah, this, this part is just getting at, um, like if we didn't have a deleted element, then we would have. Well, because two would have been just an empty space, but because we have deleted, we have this property. So yeah, now cartographer gets deleted. Now, when we insert cartographer, um, yeah, this set, on the slide here it says that we could just insert at the first deleted space. Um, it's possible cartographer already exists in the map, so we first need to probe until the, yeah. And so this holds where we so what essentially we'll do is with cartographer, it hashes to two. So we'll look at index two. And when we look at index two, we see it's deleted. So in essence, we'll say, okay, let's save index two um, as this is the first deleted element we've seen. And if cartographer is not in the hash table, then we know we can insert at position two because if there's a deleted element, then just because it's deleted, it doesn't mean we can't use that bucket anymore. It just means that we need to keep searching. So when we're trying to insert something, um, we'll want to insert at either the first deleted element or the first empty element we see, um, depending on which one comes first. So if we see a deleted element before seeing any empty elements, then we'll want to insert at the deleted element. Um, however, we need to keep probing until we find an empty element to ensure that cartographer is not in the hash table. So I think this will go through and check. Yeah. So we saw index two was deleted. We saved this as a potential place we'll want to insert if cartographer doesn't exist. Now we keep searching and we get to index five, we see another deleted, but that doesn't really mean anything. So now we search one more time with this check and we find an empty spot. And so once we find an empty spot, we know that cartographer is not in the table um, because if it was in the table, then it, um, we would either see a deleted spot here or we would see cartographer. Um, and so because we found this empty spot, now we know we can go back and insert at position two because this was the first deleted spot that we saw. Does this make sense to everyone? It can, I, I kind of went through a lot there. So does this make sense to people? But can cartographer be at location eight and location six and seven be empty? So because we're doing linear probing, um, that wouldn't be possible in this case. Uh, the reason being that we're, we're, when we're, fo we're following like the insert pattern of cartographer when we're doing this. Uh, I'll get to your question in a second, Jennifer. But so, yeah, so we are following the insert pattern for cartographer. And because we're doing linear probing, essentially we'd be going two, then three, then four, then five, and then six. And once we see that six is empty, that means that there's no other elements where cartographer could be. Um, and the reason that's the case is because um, 
cartographer like would be here or there would be a deleted element. Um, like imagine if there was more elements here and let's, cause like if cartographer essentially wasn't here, then there would, yeah, there would either be a deleted element or some other occupied element. Um, and because that's not the case and it's empty, you know that cartographer wouldn't be any further. Um, essentially because like if there were elements here and cartographer, like if, it's, if cartographer were to be at position eight or nine, there would have to be elements at six or seven because cartographer would only get to position eight or nine through linear probing if there were elements at six or seven. Um, okay, that makes more sense, Venkata, cool. Yeah, I was kind of yeah, like my explanation kind of got a little jumbled there, but essentially, if cartographer were to be at a later index, it would only get there through linear probing if there were elements before it. So that's why we know when there's an empty. Um, why does this keep happening? Then when there's an empty container, we can stop searching. Okay, Jennifer says, "What would happen if cartographer was in our array?" Would we just not insert it? Yeah, exactly. So if we found cartographer during insert, then we would not insert it. Um, and that's what you'll implement in the lab seven assignment as well. Um, you'll just like return false because it's already inserted. So you didn't insert anything. You would still follow the same search process. However, yeah, you just wouldn't end up inserting it. And then can you walk, can you walk us through the process of searching for cartographer after you erase it again? Yeah, of course. So let's go through this again. Um, so yeah, when we erase cartographer, we started at index two and there was a deleted element there. So we need to keep searching because we don't know if cartographer exists. Sorry. Yeah, this is where it is. And then we move. And so we keep linear probing until we found cartographer, which was at index five. So we replaced cartographer with a deleted element. Now we're trying to insert cartographer again and it hashes to index two. So we start at index two, we see index two is deleted. Since we see index two is deleted, um, since we see index two is deleted, that means that we need to keep searching because if an element is deleted, that means that some element that cartographer would have hashed to was originally here, but it's no longer, which means that cartographer had to have linear, been linearly probed and inserted at a different location further down. So now we'll linear probe and we'll keep searching. So we follow the same pattern that it followed when we tried to search it, search for it to erase it before. And we get to index five and we still see another deleted. So the same process in, in, like continues. So then what we do next is we'll linear probe to index six, which is here. And once we linear probe to index six, we see that it's empty. And so because it's empty, that means we know cartographer can't exist in the hash table. The reason being that if six were not, if cartographer did exist beyond element six, like at seven, eight, or nine, at any of these three, then six would have to contain either an occupied element or a deleted element. Because the only way cartographer would get to seven, eight, or nine is if there was an element here. And that means cartographer would have to be linearly probed when we're inserting it to get there. So like when we're looking it up. So essentially, if when we're looking up cartographer, it's not going to be at seven, eight or nine if six is empty, because it would have there would have had to been a, an element at six in order to get to seven, eight or nine. So six is empty. So we can go back and say, okay, now let's insert cartographer. And we'll insert it at this first deleted element. Oh, God. We'll insert it at this first deleted element because that's like the first valid spot we can insert at. You don't need to insert it at the empty element um, because we can insert it at an earlier spot. And so that's kind of something you need to save in your implementation. I know there are other questions, but does that make sense, um, Pulak? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, the person that I, I just want to make sure my explanation made sense. But other questions. Um, Joe Richards says, how does this relate to hash maps again? Um, so hash, so the, essentially what we're doing here is these are just like the erasing process for a hash table. So whenever we're dealing with hash tables, um, we want to go through this process that we just outlined 
if the hash table is implemented with linear probing and we want to erase things. So this is kind of an operation that a hash table will use, which is the erase feature. And then Neil says, um, in what scenario would we insert a cartographer in, in index six instead? I th and then Evan, I would think it two and seven were full rather than deleted. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, if two and five were, um, if two and five were occupied, let's say with random elements like duck and goose, um, then yeah, cartographer would be inserted at element six because that's empty and we didn't see any deleted elements before the empty. Essentially, you're gonna be inserting at the first empty element or the first deleted element, but whichever one comes first. So if you see a deleted element before you see an empty element, then you'll wanna save that deleted element to insert at later after you finish probing to search. Um, and then if you see an empty element immediately before you see a deleted element, then you know, okay, that means my thing doesn't exist, so I can just insert here. Does that make sense, Neil? Oh, there was more questions, okay. Yeah, thanks, okay. And then, so anytime we probe a deleted cell before an empty cell, if then we make sure that the element does not exist in the list, then we'll insert it at the deleted cell. Yes, yes. That's that's the correct intuition. So then, so, so essentially, whenever we come across, okay, awesome. So essentially, whenever we come across an empty element, it means we can insert. Yes. Once you find an empty element, then you know that the thing you were searching for, that key, is not in your hash table. So that means that you can insert it. It could also mean that you can. That means there's nothing to erase. So like, let's say we were doing. Let's say after. Let's say instead of insert cartographer, this third operation, it was erase cartographer. That would return, once we find the empty element, then we'd say, okay, cartographer's not in the hash table, so there's nothing to erase. So then we'd say like, nothing was erased. Uh, is that true for all types of probing? Yes, yeah, it's true for all types of open addressing um, systems. So linear probing, quadratic probing, double hashing. Essentially, like instead of like what we're doing here in this example, is we're linearly probing and checking for each, like the same pattern that cartographer would follow. However, if it was quadratic probing, we would just do it differently where we're checking, uh, we're checking one and then we'd be checking, or we checking one squared, then we'd be checking two squared and then so on and so forth. If it was double hashing, we'd check um, one times the second hash function result and so on. So the probing method or like the open addressing method would uh, be the same. You just follow that same pattern when you're erasing um, or whatever you're doing. Okay, did I answer everybody's questions or does anyone have any other questions? Okay. Yeah, if you, ha yeah, if you have any other questions, put it in chat and I will be sure to answer them. I will move on to the performance part now. And so this goes back to load factor and alpha that we kind of alluded to early on. So hash table performance. Essentially, if there's a lot of collisions, then it's not fun because it's just gonna really mess with our whole process and make our hash table much slower than we want it to be. So we need a good way to kind of track the load factor of our hash table in order to determine when we want to resize. So load factor is the number of elements that we have in our table divided by the number of buckets. Um, and this number of elements should encapsulate the number of actual keys as well as the number of deleted buckets. Um, because, the num because the deleted bucket, well, I guess it depends on your implementation. Uh, I think it, yeah, it definitely depends on the implementation. I would argue that it's important to have both just to be safer, but I think, I'm not sure if the slide is getting at one or the other. It's kind of up to you and that, and you'll have an option to do one or the other during lab seven. Um, Cause like overall load factor is kind of subjective. Um, 
no matter what, you definitely don't want a high load factor because you're just way more likely to have a collision. Because if there's more elements in your container, then whenever you're hashing, there's just more options for you to collide with. Um, and yeah, additionally, this talks about using prime numbers for table sizes. Yeah, that's always good just because, uh, yeah, let's see, right to big numbers. Yeah. There's actually, actually, I think I'll link a Piazza post from last semester talking about the importance of prime numbers in hash functions. And that kind of explains like why prime numbers are used, but essentially like it just makes the hashing uh, much simpler or not simpler, sorry. It makes it, um, it's more complex in a way in that it causes less collisions, but that makes like your hashing process simpler because there's less collisions. Um, and yeah, so yeah, good hash functions will typically like involve prime numbers um, in order to like make the, just make the collision likelihood lower. Um, yeah, I'll link a Piazza post because I don't think I can do it justice to explain like why prime numbers are like important um, and are as effective as they are. Um, so I'll add that to Piazza whenever, uh, some point after this lab. Um, regardless, forgetting about that for a second in general like you want to keep your load factor as as low as possible pretty much um and that'll like that'll maintain a fast the fast like properties of a hash table i guess 0. 0.75 is the general value however i'm i think 0. 0.5 is a better thing to use um and then i guess yeah some people think 0. 0.3 is even more important, um, but yeah, like this says here, the smaller like your threshold is for your load factor, the more memory you're gonna take up um, because the way that we deal with load factor is with resizing. Um, and when we resize, then we're gonna be using more memory. So if we have a smaller threshold, then you're gonna be resizing more often and therefore you'll end up using more memory compared to if you're using a larger threshold. It's as always, it's a trade off between time and memory. So, a larger threshold will end up being likely slower due to more collisions. However, you'll use less memory, versus a smaller threshold will be faster because you'll have less collisions since you're resizing more often. However, you'll take up more memory. So, common theme in the course the time and memory trade off. Any questions about load factor and performance? We'll get into resizing and rehashing in like two slides. Okay, I think everyone is good. And it also, yeah, if you don't have any questions, it's also good to just say no, just because then I know you guys are there and I can be more sure. But yeah, I will assume. Awesome, cool. Love the feedback. Okay, so just, yeah, general kind of summary of complexities that we've been discussing. Um, when you factor in load factor, um, and so load factor, yeah, it's gonna be the number of keys divided by the table size. That was the same as before. We're talking about number of elements divided by the number of buckets. Um, this is just a different way of phrasing it. Our average case ends up being a constant kind of hash. Like this is where when we're hashing to our location in the table. And then a potential, this will be like our accounting for our probing um, on average. Or, so our, yeah, our search, our lookup, insert and delete. This will be our new average complexity. Oh God, this keeps on going back and forth. Um, and then yeah, at worst, it's gonna be the number of keys because the number of keys is gonna be the pretty much the worst case amount of times that we'll need to probe. Because um, we, won't, we won't need to probe the whole table. We just need to probe until we see an empty container. So that's why our worst case is the number of keys. Um, however, like in general, we know that like the average case for a hash table should be amortized O of one. Um, so essentially what we do is with um, rehashing and resizing, our amortization allows us to have an O of one average case instead of O of one plus this K over N, which is also typically, I think it was shown in the lecture slides as alpha. Um, so yeah, resizing, rehashing will allow us to have an amortized case as for these two things, um, yeah, with separate chain, like, this really only applies to um, open addressing because like with separate chaining, you can just always tack on 
and uh, and tack on an element, you'll you'll still have this average case. This will maintain. Um, however, like you won't. I don't think you'll be able to have the same amortization under separate chaining. Um, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And this is also the case where, like, if you know for sure that a key isn't in the table, then also like it's guaranteed that you'll have O of one insert because you can just insert it right away because you know it's not in there. However, like, yeah, you can't really know for sure without searching. So, yeah, they, I don't know. Yeah, this stuff. Yeah, it's not as relevant. Um, and yeah, of course, space complexity is always going to be O of n um, in the average and the worst case, um, assuming you have a good load factor. So like if, as long as you, you have far less keys in your table size, um, then you know like you're not going to you're only going to be using at most like the memory of your um, the size of your table, uh, and typically even O of K potentially if you are like resizing very often. Um, but yeah, any questions on the complexities? Cool. All right, then. Let's move on to, oh yeah, okay. So this is just kind of a summarizing page and then I think we'll get into, uh, yeah, resizing, rehashing. So yeah, just a summary of separate chaining and open addressing. Um, yeah, this will be on Canvas. So I don't necessarily just wanna read through everything, um, but they are different. Um, separate chaining is used in the STL. So it it's by that, like it's kind of, better than open addressing, which is why it's used in that it's more efficient. Um, it's more complex, that's for sure. Um, however, it ends up being faster. Um, and utilizing the linked lists allows for a quick way to add things just by tacking onto the end. However, it does, it's a little worse with memory because things are more spread out. So you're not really getting the same benefits of using a cache, which if you take a 370, you'll understand like why that would be important. It's not really relevant to anyone. It's just something that I know Dr. P brings up in lecture and probably Darden too. Um, but yeah, open addressing will be better for the cache because um, we're utilizing the space within the buckets um, in like a, continu a contiguous chunk rather than having linked lists for each bucket. Um, because when we have linked lists for each bucket, then the memory is spread out more so versus open and addressing, everything is really contained in our in our overall buckets container and the cache will be better because of that. Um, yeah, beyond that, this is just some general info. Yeah, quadratic programming needs a load factor of less than 0.5. I don't, I'll need to find out why this is the case. I'm not exactly sure why. And yeah, double hashing does end up being a slower process. Um, it's better in handling collisions, however, computing two hash values makes it slower. Um, and yeah, of course, load factor, yeah, like I said, load factor really applies to open addressing and you it always needs to be less than one just because you can't really go above one. Um, and yeah, linear programming suffering from clusters, I think that was covered in lecture, but essentially you'll have like multiple chunks, multiple long chunks of inserted elements because you're linearly probing. So they'll all be inserted in like a contiguous sequence, um, which makes the collision process and collision resolution process slower, which is why we have other options such as quadratic probing and double hashing. Um, any questions on this general summary slide? Like you can ask questions about certain things of separate chaining or open addressing. Um, anything about this that you guys have questions on? Is there any benefit of cubic probing? I don't know. I've never even thought about it, to be honest, but that's a, it's certainly a, something that'd be cool. Um, or just like, yeah, just like, um, exp or I guess it would be factorial probing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be, I don't even know. That, yeah, that would be bad, just like factorial would be slower process. But um, yeah, just like, um, Polynomial probing, yeah, polynomial probing. I don't know. I don't know if polynomial probing would be like to what like levels of like what um, magnitude of polynomial it would be more effective than other things. I think in this class we only really cover linear and quadratic and double hashing. Um, 
I, there could be stuff online, so definitely look it up, but I'm not sure. I think that there could potentially be a benefit of having more spread out um, indices. It might be too spread out potentially, um, and I don't know if double hashing would be better. Oh, let's see. And so is, but yeah, in general, yeah, polynomial probing, I'm not sure if there's like, if there's been other things investigating that, we won't cover it in the class, but definitely look it up. Is the alpha less than 0.5 thing about quadratic probing related with residual squares? That's a good question. I have no idea, but um, honestly, I, I, I really don't know. Definitely make a Piazza post about it. Uh, I'm sure like this, like smarter I is could do it. Cause honestly, like I just have no clue, but um, yeah, because that's, that's a very, like, more mathy uh, reasoning behind it that I do not know entirely. Um, so definitely post on Piazza, because that's interesting. I'd like to see if someone else would answer that. Um, what do you mean by most common implementation for separate chaining? I don't know. Yeah, sorry if I said most. Oh, okay. So most common implementation, I think that's referring to what I was saying before. With uh, It's, like, the thing that's using the STL. So, like, geez. So the STL implementation of hash tables uses separate chaining. Um, you don't have to do that when you do the, when you're implementing hash table stuff for lab seven assignment. Um, however, yeah, separate chaining in, is used in the STL. And I think that's the extent to what we were trying to get to with that. Um, but yeah, so we use the STL in lab seven. No, so you don't, no, there's no like STL stuff in lab seven. Um, it's only, I think you can use like some STL functions and data structures and such. Um, however, like in lab seven, which will be released as soon as I'm done with this, I'll, un I'll make the folder visible. Um, but yeah, what you're going to be doing is you'll implement uh, insert operator brackets and erase using linear probing um, and having an underlying vector and all, a bunch of stuff. But yeah, it's not going to be based on the STL version. It's loosely based on like some elements of the STL version. However, I know like the STL version uses separate chaining from what I remember from when I took the class. Um, but yeah, so not much like STL stuff in lab seven. Beyond that, any other questions? And then we'll cover rehashing and that'll take us to the end. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, perfect hashing. Yeah, this is just a brief thing. Essentially, like what this slide is trying to get to is if perfect hashing occurs when you know exactly where all your keys should be going. So, like if all the keys that you're possibly want to use in a hash table, they're all there's never going to be any collisions. Um, then that means you should know, like by some property, what index they should go to. And in that case, it's likely better to use a vector because instead of even having keys for your data, you can just use um, indices as keys, as like a function to function as keys. Because of like each of your, each of like your data types or whatever data you're trying to store based on like particular keys. Um, if you know that like those keys are always gonna map to the same place, then you can, you might as well just use indices as keys instead um, and just use a vector because you'll end up like wasting time by computing the hash function, by making like the hash function compute things and um, dealing with like the potential memory overhead of a, uh, of a hash table. Whereas you could just like resize a vector to fit the amount, uh, like the range that you want um, and then go ahead and do that stuff. So that's what this is getting at. Any quick questions on this stuff before we move on to rehashing? If we want to further insert an element, won't a vector be O of n as opposed to O of one? So what this is getting at is like, if you, you would want to use a vector if you know the indices um, that your elements would be at. So if you know your index, then you can just O of one, insert it at that index in your vector. Versus, cause like you won't be like needing to do, you won't be needing to do an O of n search to find it. You would just need to insert it right away. Typically, does that make sense? Okay, cool. And then typically we are using unordered map for this functionality. Does C++ have an actual hash table keyword? Uh, I don't think it has a hash table keyword. Yeah, unordered map will have like key value pairs, 
Um, also, unordered set just is used for keys. Both of those are useful in their own ways. Um, but yeah, unordered map and unordered set are what function as hash tables in this sense. I don't think hash table is an actual keyword. And I don't know. I don't know if it's used anywhere else in the STL like that terminology, but yeah, I don't think it's a thing. Okay, cool. Let's move on to resizing and rehashing. So once we get past our load factor threshold, whatever we set it at, we're going to want to reduce that load factor threshold by rehashing. And so when we rehash, we're essentially we're making a new container. You'll typically want to double the capacity of that container. So it'll be twice the size of the original one. And then you're going to rehash. So you're not just going to be copying in elements. You're going to want to run your hash function again, or essentially you're going to want to insert again on each element that was occupied in your original hash table. And we'll walk through an example to how that works. How do we gauge if the load factor is too high? So what we were talking about before with the load factor was the load factor is essentially going to be the number of elements or keys divided by the size of your table or the number of buckets. Those are the same things, just different wording. So we'll essentially we'll be keeping track of that. So and in the lab seven, there's member variables for like number of elements, and then you'll have like your underlying vector, so you can just check the size. Um, so you'll just want to check this at multiple points within your operations to see like, okay, do I need to resize and rehash um, and so forth. So you'll be keeping track of this information to determine if your load factor is too high. And then you have some sort of threshold as like is down here. Um, and you'll, and if this load factor exceeds any of these thresholds, then you'll know you'll want to rehash and regrow or rehash and grow. Does that make sense? Cool. Awesome. All right. So, yeah. So in that case, if we if our threshold is exceeded, then we'll want to rehash and regrow, and that will allow us to have an amortize O of one insert because then we're reducing the impact of the low, of like the number of keys and like the, the how much time it takes to resolve collisions. Okay. So yeah, and yeah, I've gone over this before. You create a larger empty hash table. You insert all the non-deleted elements, so all the elements that are still ex that still exist, and some keys will, yeah, some keys will stop colliding this new larger table. Some collisions may also occur. Yeah, that's also a good thing to note is that um, even though we're creating a new larger table, it doesn't mean that there won't be any more collisions. So, like the same process will happen where we're just inserting more elements. We're going to be inserting all of the uh, elements that are still around. Um, and they might be colliding with each other even in the larger table, and they'll just be handled accordingly. Um, but it's not something, it's, it, the point of it is to make sure that's less likely to happen. However, even the original inserting process could result in some collisions while you're copying into the new table. So to go through an example of this, I think that'll make it easier to understand. So we have, like, this is our original hash table, which is of size four. Oh, my God. Um, and then we're going to, we want to rehash and regrow or rehash and grow. So we're going to create a new table that's twice the size. And now we want to copy in only the elements that are not deleted. So we're not copying, or I guess like only the elements that still exist. So these containers would be deemed occupied because they still have keys in them. So, or these buckets have keys in them. So they're occupied. So we only want to copy in these. We don't obviously like with the empty buckets, there's nothing to copy. And with the deleted buckets, we don't want to just copy a deleted element. I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, anyway, so now we'll go through this process. We'll say, okay, this one's empty, so we're not going to do anything with it. This one is contains an element. So we're going to take the, yeah, as it says, we'll take the original hash value and we'll modify the new size of the table. Make sure that you're modulo is still is going to be the new size um and then you'll be and then so this 17 represents the original hash value and so that'll get us the new index it should go into for the new table and as it says yeah if there was a collision then it would be resolved as normal 
Now the deleted elements, we don't want to add them in because that's just going to take up space that we don't need. And then with the next element, we'll take the, again, the original hash value, which in this case is 39, modulo by the new size. And then we get our new, our new index where it should go. And now in this case, thankfully there was no collision. So this rehashing process was rather simple. However, like if in the case where Q39, let's say it was a different value, if it had hashed to B17, then we would need to um, handle collisions as usual. And yeah, this is good to note that like, yeah, we weren't just copying it to the index three, just because it was originally at index three, we actually had to get the hash value again and modulo it to get the new index. And that will end us with this. And yeah, then we just destroy the old array. And we have, this is our new hash fun, our new hash table after we resize and grew. Does this make sense? Okay. So, um, yeah. Go ahead and ask questions and I'll answer them. Um, so yeah, just to clarify in the original hash table, the indices are the keys and the values are 17 and 39. I think, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't really know from this example. I think the, the keys in this case would be B and Q or may, yeah, I think the keys would be B and Q. Maybe they might be the value, but 17 and 39 are supposed to represent the original hash value in this case. That's not something you would typically store. Uh, I think it's just using this example so that it's an easier point of reference and you know what we're trying to get at. Um, in general, I would assume that, yeah, I mean, in, ge yeah, in general, like the hash table is not going to be storing your the original hash value. But in this example, 17 and 39 refer to the original hash value that we need to then use to calculate the new index. Does that make sense? So the keys would be the chars. Yeah, I think the key, yeah, you can assume the keys are the chars in this case, B and Q. All right, any other questions on the rehash and grow process? Yeah, the old is deleted and yeah, we do that stuff. Awesome, okay. So quick summary of hash tables. Um, the best thing about the hash tables is that we can get great time complexity in the average cases for search, insert, and erase. Um, and when we know what the, the amount of data we're gonna be handling ahead of time, it's also great to use because then we can, do we just have a better estimation of um, like, we, don't, we, we kind of like, then we don't need to resize and grow as much um, because we know how much data is gonna, we're going to have ahead of time, so we can just account for that as such. Um, similar to how we resize a vector. Although I don't know if unordered maps can be resized or not. Something to look into. Um, yeah, cons, potentially like hash, like a good hash function um, just means that each of the, of each each element will be will go to an index that will be unique in a sense, or as unique as it can be. That's what makes a hash function good is if it reduces the amount of coll collisions possible. However, the better a hash function, typically the more complex it is. So we never need to call that hash function. It's gonna take longer. Again, worse spatial locality. This just means that potentially our data could be all over the place in memory. In memory. Um, depending on where it is in the vector uh, that's underlying or if you're using separate chaining in the linked lists. Um, and yeah, access uses an excess of memory because you might not need all of the buckets that you have for your data um, if you have less keys. And then unsorted. Oh yeah, also yeah, it's really like you can't really sort the hash functions in an easy way um, just because the it, it would defeat the purpose of having a hash function. Because if you try and sort it, then the indices would change and the return of your hash function would be different. So yeah, I'm going to get to the questions in chat, but if you have more questions on any stuff on the slide, we'll go over those as well. 
So what if you know the, an upper limit on the amount of data? Should you resize then or no? If you know an upper limit, but you don't know an actual value, I would say like you could reserve and you would be good then and you should be good with reserve. However, like actually resizing would be, oh yeah, Evan, yeah, Evan, Evan answered it well. Yeah, there's reserve range with no resize according to the internets. So yeah, so I guess you can reserve unordered maps. So even if, if regardless of if you know an upper limit or if you just know the exact amount, then I think always reserving is a good, a good way to go about it um, in that case. Um, and yeah, and even if there was a resize, which I'm guessing there's not, um, you wouldn't want to do it if you only knew an upper limit because then you'd be like default constructing a bunch of elements, but it would be fine to have additional capacity that just might not be used. Um, and you could like refit potentially later on. However, that's not something you might need to, I don't think you'll need to worry about that project three or anything. Does that answer your question, Eleanor? Cool. Any other questions on this slide? There's one more practice problem that is like kind of quick. And then we'll, I'll like show you guys the written. I don't know if the written problem is the same as the one that's, so I don't even know, I should look at, I should, I should know that. But um, I'm not even sure if it's the same. Regardless, we can, I can answer any lingering questions after the extra example. Let's see. Okay, I don't know if the written problem is the same as the one that you were actually gonna have you do. So yeah, any other questions on the summary stuff? Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. So, um, so this is a quick practice problem. It's kind of like a exam type problem. Um, it's kind of just determining, oh yeah. Oh wait, so. Oh, I don't know if these two things are, oh, these things are different. Okay. Uh, I don't, we don't have time to discuss this one. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I'm sure you guys are on edge still of just the word exam. But um, I think this, this is kind of similar to what you would potentially have as like an exam written problem. So this would be good to go over um, on your own because yeah, I don't, we don't really have time to go through the whole thing. We don't, yeah, the algorithm you use, use the hash table. Yeah, this is more of like a written problem that could be a good practice on your own. Um, this question though is very similar to an exam multiple choice question. I think this is worth going over in the minutes remaining we have. So I'll give you guys like three minutes just so there's time for questions at the end um, of like what you think a good, what's like the time complexity that you could come up with based on the best possible worst case running time? Yeah, so a classic exam problem. I, I, we're trying to move away from those, but it's still a good question to practice. So take a couple of minutes, think about the potential complexity and we'll come back at uh, 4.54 and that'll leave the last couple of minutes for some questions.
what data structure is. Oh, unordered map. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Thank you for answering that, Evan. Yeah, unordered map. Okay, so if anyone has any guesses on what this would be, we provide set. Probably don't need another red set, do we? Um, for this problem, um, I don't think you need an unordered set, no. No, I don't. That's close, Kevin. I think it's very close. But I'll try and explain in the next slide. Yeah, these questions are really hard, honestly. I was never good at them when I took a class. Okay, yeah. So I think the gist of this problem is that you're supposed to, like, you want to replace, um, like, each letter with, yeah, essentially, yeah, each letter with a blank letter. Um, so you want to go through and find within each string um, like anywhere where there's a, like any index where there's a like star character. And I think that that represents a blank. Um, and that'll like, and so you'll determine, yeah, exactly. So each key would be a string. So like any string, so like anything that has the same, yeah, I think a blank equals a star. And so within that, you'll want to find, you want to insert anything that has like similar, you know, like similar words in terms of like their blanks, um, either match. Yeah, I think that their blanks would match. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 So yeah, I'll go over. I'll show the solution just because we're coming close on time. So yeah, it would be m squared n. Um, so yeah, Kevin, you're close with the m times n. Wait, so by the end, won't every single every string be blankified? I think, let's see. Oh, if you find, I'm trying to think. I think that you would have to like check and see which words would have. Yeah, honestly, yeah, it is a confusing problem. I agree. I'm pretty confused on that too. So like, I, this is not going to be like, I like there could be exams that would be with similar questions, but I don't think that we wouldn't have a multiple choice that would be this wordy whatsoever. Regardless, um, yeah, every string is length. I think every string is length M. And then, so you have N words that you're inserting into your hash table. And so in order to find words that are similar and that like they're, they have like, I think they have the same characters except for the blanks. So like the, so they have the same characters including the blanks. Like if you had um, like, L O A L L star S T would happen twice potentially if you had lost and last. Um, so those would be considered similar words because if you put a blank at the word at the second position, then lost and last have this are the same string. And so you would need to do a lookup throughout the hash table, which would or you need to do a lookup um, for each word. For every yeah, for every letter of each word, you would need to do a lookup on all of the letters to see like where it matches. If that kind of makes sense.
Okay. Yeah. So like essentially like you have like lost, let's say, and so you're going to replace lost, you'll first replace index L with a star, and then you'll search the rest of the words and say, is there anything else that has OST? Like with star OST, is there any similar words to lost with star OST? So it could be, I don't know what's a word that starts with a different letter. Anyway, you move on to the next index. You say, okay, now let's do L star ST. Then we'll say, okay, last is a similar word because last has this matching L ST and then you ignore the second index. And then you do the same thing. You say, okay, now L A or L O star T. You say, okay, what's the possible words that are similar to that? And so on and so forth. So I think you like with any given string S, you would want to search and say, what are the similar words? Um, given that like we were initially provided a set of words that can be like the dictionary, let's say. Like we're gonna search through all the words in the dictionary and that would be our N. So let's see, so yeah, Eleanor says, okay, O of M times N times M makes sense now because there are M times N possible words that could be made by putting a star somewhere, yep. And each time you, you look it up, it's an additional O of M, yes. That makes sense. So best possible worst case is a bit confusing in essence. What would worst possible worst case be? So best possible worst case running time. Yeah, I, that wording is awful. Uh, but like, so essentially that means that imagine you have the best possible algorithm. What is the worst came, worst is the worst case time complexity of that algorithm? That's what it's asking for. If it was worst possible worst case, that means it's, Okay, what's the worst possible algorithm? And what's the worst case of that worst possible algorithm? Typically we'll say, okay, try and think about what's the best algorithm. And then from that, what's the worst case of that best algorithm? I agree it's confusing wording. It's why like these kinds of questions are gonna be less common um, going forward, I hope. Best possible running time or the worst case running time. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the wording can be very trippy. Um, yeah, Eleanor's explanation above is good for like summing up what the solution is in essence. Um, and yeah, I had tried to explain that like you're replacing like each index of a given word to find, let's see, would it be O of N squared times M squared for worst possible worst case? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know what the worst case algorithm would be. Like, I guess it would be like a brute force to see what are all the similar words. Um, that seems like, yeah, that seems like it would be a decent complexity. I don't know if we'll ever ask for like worst possible worst case though, because it's not like a, in practice, like if you ever want to like ask these questions to yourself when you're thinking about solutions to a problem, it's not like the ideal thing to think about. Like, oh, well, I could do brute force. I guess it could be, but regardless, yeah, I think that we typically won't, but that's not, that seems like, that seems like a reasonable complexity for worst possible worst case. I'm honestly not as not so sure, but it would be something so much like a brute force searching like all the words and then searching all of the characters. So that looks good. Um, yeah, try not to get too tripped up on this problem, but if anyone has any other questions, please post them in the chat. Um, wait, in hash tables, if lookup is normally O of one, can you explain why we use O of N here? So it's O of N because we need to look up like N times because we need to look up each word, um, I believe, yeah. And so you need to, yeah, you need to look up each potential word in the dictionary, like if that's our set of original words. Average case? I'm not entirely sure. I think it would be... Hmm. For the best possible average case, so the best algorithm average case, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it, Neil. Uh, best a average case, I'm not exactly sure. It could be something similar, but I don't know because each lookup is O of 1 and N lookups. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, let's see. Well, I just want to see real quick what the handwritten is. Um, prefix. Oh, replace words. Yeah, this is the same. Yeah, so this is the handwritten problem. Like you can see it in the slides when I post the slides. Um, but yeah, that's the same that you guys will be doing. So that's good. Any other questions before I stop recording and end? Or any, and it could be any questions at all. But this is pretty much brings us to the end of the end of the end of the live lab for people who need to go. Why do we need n lookups if it's a hash table? So there's still n words that you would need to search um, for every letter m in every word n. You must do an o of m lookup. Where's the additional o of m from? Come from. So what we need to do is that we're searching through every letter um, in the string. So that's going to be O of M. And then for every word, we need to look through, again, an O of M search to see if it's similar. So for the N words that exist, because we still we can find, like, we can find the words in O of 1 to, like, examine them. But I don't think that would be, this, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to search the word in O of one, because we need to look at every character of the word. So that's where the O of N comes from. So, but then the number of lookups is O of M, uh, or well, we need to do an O of M lookup because we are searching through the entire word to find it. Uh, or like we need to like look through each character of the word, if that makes sense. No, so in this, so similar words would be like lost and last if the second index, as in like A and O, if that was a star. So L star ST, that is going to be common between lost and last. So those would be similar. Any other questions? Favorite mathematical proof? Huh. I don't know. I'm trying to think. I took 376 last semester. I really liked it. Honestly, 376 is awesome. A lot of people don't disagree with that, though. Uh, Favorite proof. I saw this weird YouTube video like when I was taking 376 where they proved that like the summation of all numbers from 1 to infinity was equal to negative 12, I think, or something. So look up. It's like a number file video, but it's cool. The, oh, negative 1 over 12. Yeah, that one, I thought that was cool. But I watched it while I was in 376. It's not in 376 at all. I just like came across it. But that's, I thought that was just wacky and cool. And that it actually is used. Natural deduction. I hated 203. I hated 203, but love 376. I got to say. I was, probably, I was just more invested in 376 personally. But from 376, I think that reductions, if, you, if you've taken it or you're going to take it, reductions are um, a, a big part of the first half of the class. And they're also important during the second half. But I thought reductions are really cool. And it's a cool way to prove like undecidability. Um, I just thought they were fun to think about. But a lot of people don't like them just because it's uh it's like a it's just I don't know. It can be it's definitely really confusing at the start. But once you get the hang of it, it's it's pretty fun. So if you look into like uh um Turing reductions or polynomial reductions, I think those kind of proofs are always cool. So yeah. Um I'm going to stop recording now, but you guys are free to go. Or if you have any other questions, let me know. But thanks for coming.